The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them the same way. Finally he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death, and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, first of all, going back to that gospel reading, shame on those priests and Pharisees. They held themselves to be so righteous. And yet, when Jesus told this parable, it tweaked their guilt. And they knew he was talking about them. But they didn't confess or beg forgiveness, or repent. Instead, they wanted to arrest him. They could usually find some doctrinal loophole to empower them to quell any resistance to their authority or privilege. But Jesus was a different matter. Enough people seem to believe that Jesus embodied God's law and maybe even God's own spirit more than they did. So they couldn't dare arrest him. It would make them look bad. It's important for us to consider that these priests and Pharisees, with all their authority and political and clerical power, weren't bad people. These priests were leaders of the temple, ministers of their congregation. The Pharisees were a fundamental Jewish sect that believed in strict adherence of the laws of the Torah. And that would mean especially the Ten Commandments. But their problem was that the law is always subject to interpretation. So the priests and Pharisees found self-assurance in their religious exercise because they could interpret the commandments to their own comfort level. They truly did love God so much that they were proud of it. And that was the root of their sin. Well, we've just proven that we don't know the Ten Commandments as well as those guilty priests and Pharisees. But like them, we assume our basic righteousness. In fact, like them, 
we may be rather proud of our righteousness. At least we know we're more righteous than our neighbors, so we can look down on them. Like the priests and Pharisees, our pride is the root of much of our sin. Wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say love of money is the root of all sin? No. That was Paul (laughs) writing in his second letter to Timothy. But... Money and pride so often walk hand in hand. Money buys privilege, and privilege puts other people down in ways often unknown, which break many of the commandments. So I've prepared a sermon to make us all feel really rotten. How do we break the commandments without knowing it? Let's review them one at a time. First, you shall have no other gods before me. What do we depend on instead of God? Well, money comes quickly to mind along with the privilege and power that it brings. But what do we worship? Maybe some personality or political leader or sports figure, celebrity. A friend of mine says that a celebrity is someone who's famous because they're well known. (laughs) Who or what really deserves our worship? besides God. Let's move on to the second one. You shall make no idols. A lot of religious art has been destroyed by wrong interpretation of this commandment. We don't idolize statues. We do idolize money. Would you rather have a green piece of paper in your wallet with a picture of George Washington? or Abe Lincoln, or Benjamin Franklin. Think about that. And if this sounds a lot like our response to the first commandment, that's why Martin Luther combined them into one. We worship what we idolize, and we should worship only one God. Number three. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Well, this isn't just about swearing so much as it is a law to remain in the spiritual peace that can accept God's controlling even the most distracting circumstance if we don't get in the way. And that extends the commandments to all those other four-letter words that we use to express our irritation. It's better to keep our four-letter words to P-R-A-Y and L-O-V-E. Number four, keep the Sabbath day holy. Jews place what seems like too great an emphasis on the Sabbath. Two weeks ago, we had the story from Exodus of the manna from heaven to feed the hungry Hebrews in the desert. You might remember that they were to gather twice as much on the sixth day so that they wouldn't have to do that work on the Sabbath. They were to refrain from all work from sunset on Friday to sunrise on Sunday morning. 
That's why they had to bury Jesus before the sun set on Friday and why they couldn't visit his tomb until after the sunrise on Sunday. But there can be holiness in our labor. So keeping the Sabbath holy really only means to be fully aware of the presence of God. So we really could keep the Sabbath holy every day. Why don't we? How often do we forget? Number five, honor your father and your mother. Our parents teach us how to live. It's sad to say not all parents show positive examples. Yet, children can learn important life lessons even from bad parenting. So those parents should be honored as well. And then, anyone we meet, it might be someone's parent, worthy of honor. Therefore, we should honor everyone. Number six, you shall not murder We probably rate this one as the most obvious of the ten. In fact, I think it was the first one that was named in our little game there. But is it really the most important? Some translations say, thou shalt not kill. I believe that's the way it was reported here in our game. Thou shalt not kill. That's different. Murder is intentionally killing another human being. Killing is ending life. So does that rule out swatting flies and mosquitoes and and wasps? Should we never buy another hunting license? Is trophy hunting less honorable than meat hunting? Should we all be vegetarians? And what do we say about God's self-contradiction by killing most of life forms in Noah's flood? And in the sacred story of Passover, where the firstborn of all Hebrews were killed, as if in retribution for Pharaoh's order to kill all the male babies of the Hebrews. And then... God has all of Pharaoh's army drowned. More important, are we somehow complicit in the death of war victims or those killed by the consequences of industry in which we may be invested? I confess that I own some mutual funds So I don't really know exactly where or what I'm invested in. And I use some beautiful exotic woods in the ornamental woodwork that I do. I don't know where those woods come from. Would I stop doing my woodwork? if I knew that I was contributing to illegal deforestation of the Amazon rainforest, maybe displacing native people from their home and their culture, and contributing to global warming by eliminating trees that convert carbon dioxide to oxygen. Maybe I'm complicit in murdering us all. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. I wish this was worded different. Instead of a prohibition against messing around where you shouldn't, 
it would read better as a positive reminder to hold marriage sacred so that adultery would be unthinkable both for the damage it would do to your own marriage and that of another partner. Remember, Jesus expanded this commandment to make all lust a sin. You shall not steal. Well, of course, we know better than to shoplift or snatch purses from old ladies, even young ladies. But do we even know when our purchase of clothing might rob from the well-being of an underpaid garment worker in Indonesia? And there are other ways to steal without knowing it. I feel robbed, as I did the other day, when I head for an empty parking space and find someone left their empty shopping cart in it. Even more to the point, how does our wealth and privilege knowingly steal from those who are disenfranchised? Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This means more than don't tell lies because they don't show love of neighbor as yourself. Love neighbor as self. My mother once was asked by a neighbor about some other neighbor and she said, my mother always said, if you can't say anything good about someone, don't say anything at all. So, I'm not going to say anything at all. (laughs) Uh, I don't know how well she knew that person she was talking about, or maybe even whether her clever avoidance of negative reflection on that person might have misrepresented them in a negative way. We never know the other person's story. So we don't know why they do what they do. And it doesn't necessarily make them bad people. One of Jesus' commandments was, judge not so that you won't be judged. I probably haven't said enough about that one, but let's leave it there. Finally, the last one, You shall not covet. And there's all this list of things we shouldn't covet. Oddly, and a list that seems to accept as perfectly fine slavery. Don't want stuff that isn't yours. Don't want more than you need. And that applies to more than just tangible things like a bigger house or a vacation in Tuscany. It relates as well to intangibles like influence and privilege. Don't want what God hasn't already given you. We rely on the Ten Commandments as the foundation of our moral being and Jesus Christ as the cornerstone of that foundation. The priests and Pharisees rejected that cornerstone. Parsing out that parable that Jesus tells in the Gospel reading this morning as so many sermons have done before, we see that God is the landowner, the whole earth is the land that produces the harvest, humankind is given dominion over that land, so we are the tenants, and the prophets are the slaves whom the people savagely disrespected. God sent more slaves 
And when that didn't work out, God sent Jesus Christ, his own son. It wasn't the people who wanted to kill the son. It was their leaders, the priests and Pharisees. So when Jesus told the parable, those priests and Pharisees knew he was talking about them. He was pointing out the ways that they were not following the Ten Commandments. Those commandments they knew so well that surely they could have named all ten of them in order. It's also aimed at us. How much better are we than the priests and Pharisees? We break the commandments all the time without even knowing it. If we were as righteous as we think we are, we wouldn't need Christ and and the forgiveness he offers. Now, I don't mean for this to sound like a fire and brimstone sermon. Hammering away at what sinful wretches we are. We probably are sinful, but I don't think we're wretches. We, God forgives us because we don't know what we're doing. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus made it much easier for us to remember the Ten Commandments because he condensed them into one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We call it the Great Commandment. It turns all of those thou shalt nots into one positive statement. Because we have a loving, positive feeling about ourself, we should also love our neighbor. And we would do nothing to tarnish that relationship. Because our neighbor and ourself are created in the image of God, anything we might do to break our good and loving relationship with neighbor hinders our relationship with God. Not to mention the guilt that it causes that reduces our own self-love. If we love the Lord, the first commandment, if we love the Lord, we would do nothing contrary to the commandments. But we break them routinely, sometimes without even knowing it. Thank God. Jesus said, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. Amen.